Just stop the recording. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first evening webinar of the season of the 2022-23 school year. It's good to have everybody here. It's a nice crowd we have. Um, we are so excited to have three extraordinary individuals here tonight to present a view from the inside. And these three individuals have throughout their life worked through challenges and have built amazing careers. They are here to share what they have experienced in their own education and in their professional lives and how they have used their personal experiences to shape um, how they help other people. And we're so happy to have them. Um, these three attorneys have also presented every year at the Council for Parent Attorneys and Advocates. Um, it's called COPA and it's an organization that gathers together every year to um, pass on important information to parents, attorneys and advocates and they will be presenting again this year at the COPA conference in San Francisco. So thank you three for making extra time for us. We just have a few ground rules for this evening. First of all, more, most importantly, we are recording. So at the end of the presentation, we will allow time for questions. You can type them into the Q&A. Just make sure when you type in your questions that you're not typing in anything confidential that you don't want out there in the public forum because not only are we recording, we're going to post this recording on our website at www.spednet.org. Um, and for anyone to view later on if they don't have a chance to see it live. So just keep that in mind. Please keep all confidential information to yourselves and don't post it if you don't want it out there. Um, also, um, just make sure that you understand that anyone, any information provided to you this evening by the presenters or by SpedNet Wilton um, and the panelists is not intended to be legal advice. It's really just meant for informational purposes only. So just understand that. And if that's, I think that's it, Caroline, unless I forgot something, I will turn the mic over to Michael Gilberg. We have Michael Gilberg here, Robert Tedisco, and Patara Jeppe. And we're so excited to have them. Thank you guys for coming. And Michael, the mic is yours. Thank you, Janine. Thank you again for having us. Let me know if my audio is a problem. I've been having some microphone issues. Um, as just a brief intro, as Janine said, we're all special ed attorneys with a view from the inside. We've all lived with disabilities that we represent children in special ed through. And so we are all informed by our personal experience. And we're each going to talk about our own story and our own disability. And I'm going to start talking about autism because I'm an attorney on the autism spectrum. Uh, just to give a brief background, I was not properly diagnosed till I was 18. I went through the special ed system. I did not get an appropriate education. Everything that they did for me was wrong. And as I always say, I was lucky to have a mother who believed in me and made sure I got where I needed to go. But it was also myself. You know, I got to college without having a proper high school education, but because I was motivated to succeed, I was able to catch myself up and fill in those gaps. Unfortunately, not every 18 year old child is gonna be 18 year old adult child, whatever, is gonna be able to, have that motivation and say, you know what, I'm going to fix what was done wrong. So I think that that's a big issue that we have to, you know, deal with these services earlier and not wait till someone's 18 in college and hope they'll just catch up. Uh, I was lucky that I was able to, but it's also caused a lot of trouble in my life and a lot of challenges. I'm very involved in the autism community, both in New York, I serve on the State Autism Spectrum Advisory Board, and I'm in solo practice, a special ed attorney practicing in both New York and Connecticut. And as Janine mentioned, COPA, I'm on the national board of COPA, and I'm very involved with the Autism Society nationally, co-chairing their ABA task force right now. So with that, I'll ask for the next slide. For those who don't know, autism is a neurodevelopmental disability affecting the ability to process information, particularly in the areas of communication and social interaction. We probably have to update that number. The one in 59, I think, is now in the 40s. The number is always changing. The prevalence is getting higher. And I don't think it's that more people are having or being are getting autism, or I think it's that they're we're getting better diagnostic criteria. For years, women have been chronically underdiagnosed. And if you look at the rate of diagnosis, it's increasing much rapid more rapidly with females than males, largely because males have been more properly diagnosed because it's autism is thought of as a male disorder. And so a lot of females with autism are known to retreat into themselves, to be introverted. And if they're not causing trouble in the class, 
the teachers don't notice it. They fly under the radar because they're quiet, they're introverted. You know, they don't know what's going on inside the student, whereas the boys are more likely to be disruptive and violent. And, you know, the schools take the attitude of even if the child is struggling, if you're not disruptive, they don't notice you. Autism is a spectrum, so no two people are alike or will have the same challenges. You know, that's a big thing about autism. People don't understand. I've had people tell me, you don't look autistic. I don't know what looking autistic means. Um, there's no such thing as looking autistic. You know, I know women who are on the spectrum and people are like, but she's so beautiful. How could she be autistic? Because it has nothing to do with physical appearance. I know, you know, it, it, just because she's a beautiful woman doesn't mean she can't have autism. There are autistic women who've been in beauty pageants. Um, people don't realize that not everybody will have every skill. I've had a lot of issues with social deficits growing up. But I also can read subtlety and sarcasm in a way that a lot of autistics can. People have said to me, you're like the most non-autistic autistic sometimes because I can read certain things. But a lot of autistic people have sensory issues. I don't generally have those. They have, they're, they have, they have a really strong reactions to visual or auditory stimuli. What I realized a few years ago was I have an overly sensitive to smell but it's much easier to manage in your life if the sensitivity is smell or taste, because taste is easy. You don't like it, don't eat it. Smell is easier to manage, but if you're being bombarded by visual or auditory stimuli, that's harder to manage. And so I think that's something we need to be mindful of. You know, not everybody with autism is gonna have every piece of it. So there are things where I know people on the spectrum where it's night and day, you know, there are people on the spectrum who have such lack of, a social understanding that it's hard for me to even relate to them when they don't understand certain basic social nuances. So I think that, you know, we have to remember no two people with autism are alike. The famous phrase, you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Next slide. Autistic people are very known for special interests. Some of the common ones there, trains. Trains are a big one. A lot of autistics love trains. Think about Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory. Dinosaurs. I had that when I was a kid. I grew out of it. Now I don't remember any of it. Sci-fi. I never got into sci-fi, but a lot of autistics are into sci-fi and geek culture. Disney. I have a couple of friends who are very into Disney. I swear they could be autistic. I've never gotten the Disney thing, but there's a lot of autistics very obsessed with Disney sports. I've seen people on social media who are autistic. They get obsessed with their sports team. And if someone trash talks their team, they go insanely angry. I used to be a bigger baseball and hockey fan, but I've never been that passionate about it. Video games, it's another one. Some less common ones. I had a client once who was obsessed with toilet balls. I said to the mother, well, he should be a plumber then. It won't be as weird if he's asking people to see their toilets. I've heard about people with roller coasters, Greek mythology. You could have a special interest for anything. The question is, can that special interest be channeled into something productive in your life and career? And can it be done in a non-destructive, a special interest is a problem if it's destructive or it's done in an improper way. For example, I've had clients with a special interest to sex and that doesn't always manifest in the most positive ways, let's say. Next slide. There are now three levels. They've, well, got, they've gotten rid of what used to be known as Asperger's, PDD, NOS, the pervasive, which is pervasive developmental disorder, and they've made it level one, level two, level three. Level one is requiring some support. It's people like me who are high, what used to be called high functioning autism or Asperger's. There's some social difficulties, but you more or less can blend in. Level two is substantial support, much more narrow social interest, special interests, much more restrictive social interaction, much more support. And three is very substantial support deficits in verbal and nonverbal. That's a lot of people who are intellectually disabled. And that's a big thing. There's two kinds, autistic people, can, you can break us break autistic the autistic community into two back baskets, I always say, those with an intellectual disability and those without, because it's so different. I've always said, I can't speak for the intellectually disabled because I don't know that, it's not my life experience. The people who can't feed or toilet themselves, I can't speak for them. There's also a lot of nonverbal autistics, but that's not linked to intellect. At COPA last year in Boston, we had a keynote speaker who is non-speaking, but she's brilliant. She has a master's degree. She's probably a future special ed lawyer, but she just doesn't talk. 
And the problem is in society, we assume if somebody is not speaking, they must have a lower intellect. They must be less capable. We equate verbal ability with intelligence. And because the person communicates by typing, they're assumed to be less intelligent, even if they're, again, brilliant. Um, next slide. People with autism, and this is a big thing, do not need to be fixed. They just need to be taught to live in society. A lot of people in the past have talked about fixing autistics. And the question is, I've always said, um, you don't need to fix somebody, but you need to give them the tools to live in society. If somebody is flapping their hands, but it's not harming anybody, why do you need to fix that? Let them be who they are. On the other hand, I have a client now who is about eight years old and she's been stimulating herself sexually in class, let's say. And that's a behavior that has to be addressed because she shouldn't, she can't do that in a, in a normal society. I always say there are autistic people who are more impaired, who have this thing with touching other people or getting violent. And your right to, to your right to be an individual doesn't violate is fine as long as it doesn't violate my right to bodily autonomy. So the question of what we have to fix, I think hinges on, is the behavior dangerous to themselves or others? A lot of kids run in the street. We obviously have to fix that behavior, not because we're saying don't be autistic because we can't have kids running in the street. People with autism often have high anxiety, obsessive or repetitive thoughts and social isolation leading to depression. That is true. I am People who know me will tell you, I can be very obsessive and repetitive and anxious. And I do have, I've had the social isolation. There's a very mistaken I belief out there that those of us on the spectrum don't want social interaction and that everybody's like, for those who've heard of her, Temple Grandin, who is a very cold and distant and emotionless person and somewhat robotic. And because she was the first well-known autistic, people started to believe all autistics were Temple Grandin and she's not, and we're not. And most autistics I know want connection, friendships, relationships, dating, spouses. It's just harder sometimes, you know, especially if you're on a date and you, when you're trying to make a first impression. As it says, suicide is the lead, leading cause among autistic people without intellectual disabilities. With intellectual disabilities, it's epilepsy. I don't know why, I don't think there's a scientific reason for this, why those people with intellectual disabilities on the spectrum have a higher rate of epilepsy. Those of us without intellectual disability is, is no more than the normal population, but there seems to be a link between epilepsy and autism with an intellectual disability. I can't tell you why. The suicide one is easier. People feel depressed and isolated. And the reason, obviously, those who are intellectually disabled are less likely to commit suicide is, is what I call a blissful ignorance. They don't know that they're different or they don't feel it as much. They're not as aware. So they get to live in what I call a blissful ignorance. Next slide. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Thank you, Michael. Okay, I'm going to talk about ADHD. Um, I was diagnosed as an adult uh, when I was 34. That was a very long time ago. And um, I realized after my diagnosis, uh, a lot of my pre-diagnosis life made a lot more sense to me. And I got very involved in the disability community similar to Michael and Patara. And we all universally feel that um, having this disability and understanding what it's like from the inside really gives us particular insight into the frustrations and struggles that our clients face on a daily basis. So, you know, I appreciate the disclaimer in the beginning of the program that this is not uh, essentially legal advice, but this is really more about trying to help uh, parents, uh, adults out there understand uh, these disabilities from people who experience it. And too often our clients are either too young or not able to articulate this for themselves. And it really becomes our responsibility to provide a voice for them. So I'm going to talk about ADHD uh, in terms of what it is. It's a neurobiological disorder that affects the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is essentially responsible for executive functioning. It also involves three neurotransmitters, um, 
dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, which is essentially uh, adrenaline. And it also involves these executive functions. And uh, that's really important to understand because uh, executive functioning has become a less stigmatized buzzword. Uh, a lot of people talk about executive functioning and how it relates to ADHD. Executive functions are the impairments that go along with ADHD in that portion of your brain. They involve organization, prioritization. Uh, time is particularly difficult because you know, there's a, 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 an incorrect belief out there that people with ADHD are poor time managers. And that is true, but that is a gross understatement. With ADHD, the issues really involve a distorted time perception. Uh, people with ADHD have a lot of difficulty accurately um, understanding how long a task is going to take to perform. Uh, we often think we have a lot more to do than a lot more time to do something than we actually do. Um, in terms of behavior with ADHD, the next two are uh, issues. Hyperactivity kind of jumps out. As Michael said earlier, the hyperactive uh, student typically gets on the teacher's radar because they want to address the situation, not necessarily to address it, but to keep and maintain order in the classroom. But more often than not, one of my particular specialties, I guess, in the special ed within that umbrella is I represent a lot of kids in um, school disciplinary uh, proceedings. And in my experience, impulse control is really the behavioral culprit. Um, one of the things Michael mentioned earlier that I think is worth uh, emphasizing is the separation between a disability and the actions that that disability um, manifests, like a symptom of it. Uh, for instance, Michael indicated earlier that you, you can't or you shouldn't necessarily want to fix autism. However, certain behaviors need to be fixed or adjusted. And again, uh, I don't think anyone should ever have to apologize for having ADHD or any disability. However, we have to separate that from the conduct that typically will stem from our disability and parents and their children have to understand that the conduct may be wrong. The conduct may have consequences, but it's much more important to understand where those behaviors came from. And with ADHD, for instance, I often find in my practice that kids with ADHD understand the difference between right and wrong. They know you're not supposed to take something that belongs to somebody else, but more often than not, it's an inability to control the impulse to do what seems like a good idea at that instant. Um, I know it's wrong to steal something. The kid next to me had the new iPhone. I couldn't stop myself. I needed to see it, to play with it, to take it. Um, and again, you would have to separate the actual taking of the property with where the impulse comes from. Um, also, with respect to attention, that's another kind of misunderstood component of ADHD. Um, I think that people look at it in a black and white way, either you can pay attention or you can't. Parents will often say to me, the teacher said my son has ADHD, or they think he does, um, that he can't concentrate in school, but you know, I, how come I can't get him to stop playing video games for 10 or 12 hours straight? What you have to understand is it's not a necessarily, even within attentive types, and, and I believe I'm more of a combined type, it's not an inability to pay attention. ADHD is more, you have to think of it as an inability to regulate attention. So there is either no attention or extreme hyper-focus. And it's very difficult for people with ADHD to kind of find some middle ground or a baseline that most people uh, go through their lives with. In fact, uh, I often get 
uh, criticism from my wife about my hyper focus when I'm hyper -fo hyper focusing on a project or something. And what I try to explain to her is that so often it's difficult for us to uh, focus on something when you find something that you're able to climb into, so to speak. I, I typically try to ride that wave if I can, um, because otherwise it's very difficult to do that on my own. Another issue typically has to do with short-term memory. Um, you have to think of your memory in two components. One is if you think of a computer, for instance, a computer has two types of memories. One is the overall storage capacity, the file cabinet inside your computer. And the other is what's known as random access memory. And that really is how many projects or programs can operate simultaneously. And typically people with ADHD have phenomenally scary long-term memory. However, short-term memory essentially doesn't exist. It's very difficult. It's very fleeting, which is why we lose things and we forget things. And, uh, you know, it is uh, those fleeting moments are much more difficult to channel. Now, the difference between executive functioning impairment and ADHD, if you think of it like a spectrum, um, AD, uh, executive functioning are the symptoms. So people with executive functioning impairment don't necessarily have ADHD, okay? Um, you could have mild executive functioning impairment. Um, you could have more pronounced executive functioning impairment. And the center of this diagram really shows executive functioning impairment so severe that it, it rises to the level of diagnosable ADHD. And, you know, it's if you think about it in like a, a, a kind of a contrasting theory, somebody with executive functioning impairment doesn't necessarily have ADHD. However, if you have ADHD, you definitely have an executive functioning impairment. So try to think of it that way. Okay. Um, this is something that I, I like to kind of give people as a visual also. When we were young and uh, in school, we were often taught that if you put your hand on that hot stove, a signal goes up your hand and says, it's hot, move uh, up to your brain, it's hot, move your hand away. So we automatically think of it as a like when you plug a light fixture into the wall, the electricity goes up the wire and the light goes on. But it's not that same way in the human body. The body, uh, the, our central nervous system is not made up of a long continuous wire. It's made up of short disconnected wires, okay? And if you look at this slide, this shows really the disconnected wires, which are bridged by these neurotransmitters. And they have to be uh, plentiful enough, and they also have to have specific receptors. And what will happen is if those receptors are not appropriate or there is not enough dopamine, which really goes to the pleasure center of your brain, or uh, norepinephrine, which is really the um, uh, adrenaline, a lot of these kids will gravitate towards crisis situations um, in order to force themselves to produce adrenaline or dopamine uh, and really try to, in a way, it's, it's a, a way of forced prioritization in a way, okay? People with ADHD typically will gravitate towards crisis situations. And many of us, myself included, will even create these crisis situations because it's the only means that we have sometimes to move forward, okay? Now, um, I, I use this model to really kind of talk about um, uh, ADHD in terms of what goes on, because it's very hard for an outsider to understand what it's like inside of the ADHD brain, okay? You think of hyperactive people and you think of inattentive people, 
But for combined types or even for the inattentives, there's a lot of what I refer to as cognitive hyperactivity, okay? So if you picture a very uh, busy city like New York or Paris or something, um, and people are coming from all over the world to see this place, but instead of a number of international airports, there's a very poorly run landing strip. OK, so these planes have no place to land. So in an airport situation, what they typically do is they just kind of stack them up above the airport in, in a holding pattern. But if one of those airplanes had an emergency on it, there was a fire, there was a mechanical difficulty, someone had a heart attack, God forbid, that plane would get instant clearance to land. And that's what happens with people with ADHD. We move to those crises, we look for them, we create them because that's how we function. We literally go through life putting out fires from here to there. Uh, earlier on in my career, uh, I was a, a prosecutor in a criminal defense work. And being on trial is a really high stim um, a form of activity that really kept me up and on my game. But once that trial was over, it was very difficult to find motivation for the next project or the next case. Also, in terms of those administrative tasks, that's where a lot of these kids trip up. And what happens is um, they're intelligent kids. Every single one of my clients is extremely intelligent, regardless of their disability. But you have to think of ADHD not as an intelligence deficit. It's really a performance deficit deficit based upon tasks that you're required to do. And there are certain transitionary times in their lives where kids are challenged more than others. Typically, fourth grade is a huge one. Um, middle school, um, going into high school, and certainly college is another very uh, big landmark change for them. And typically, when I speak to, to my clients, I will ask them, you know, what the issues they face are. And I hear a lot of situations like this. It's not that the work is that much harder this year. It's just so much more that I have to remember to do. And we don't just evaluate kids as they get older based upon how intelligent they are, but there's rules that they have to follow. They have to be places uh, and be prepared. So for instance, when they get to that level, uh, now they have to keep track of their assignments. They have to keep track of their lunch. I can't tell you how much stress goes into a kid with ADHD's day if they forget something like that. They have to remember to bring their lunch money to school. The right book has to come home for homework or to go back to school. Uh, oftentimes, they're required to keep a different notebook for a different class or a binder. Um, those have to be coordinated. I was the obnoxious kid in the class that never, ever had a pen growing up uh, and was frantic about it. As they get older, they also have, um, have to manage their calendar and their projects, book reports, term papers, things that they have to do over time. That becomes an issue. There's this quote that I particularly like from uh, Albert Einstein, where he says that everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And you really have to understand what's going on inside the mind of a child. And, and I think Patara and Michael will agree with me to say that we're in a unique position to be able to share these insights with parents so they can understand the children much better. And also, it's very helpful to us when we see the struggles they're facing and we see that frustration so they understand that's, that they're not alone. And that's really important. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Patara now. Thanks, Robert. Um... So I'm extremely dyslexic. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about dyslexia, um, how it's impacted my life and my practice. Um, I was diagnosed um, at eight years old in the third grade. Um, for many people say, oh, wow, you're so fortunate. You were so young. Um, I often though question the adults in my life, um, especially when I hear that statement because I wasn't reading at all. 
So it didn't take a rocket scientist to, to see that something was wrong. Um, I received a lot of RTI, response to intervention, a lot of services in school and out of school. Um, and then I like to say, I feel like I experienced almost every educational environment that the DOE had to offer, um, and also attended a non-public school, uh, now a private school. Uh, they've transitioned for children with language-based learning disabilities. Um, so I've navigated a lot of the situations that I see um, my clients and their families experiencing. Um, I think that my lived experience is what drove me to want to be a special ed attorney in the first place um, and definitely informs my practice. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so what is dyslexia, right? Um, dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the final phonological components of language that is often unexpected in relation to our cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom interventions. So what does that mean? Um, Robert talked a lot about um, uh, our neuro uh, system and the way the brain works in relation to ADD. Um, and similarly, dyslexia is a neurological disability. Um, I am no scientist, um, but the way that I like to um, describe dyslexia to people um, is my brain thinks of an individual brain as this system of highways and roads, so to speak. And there are cars on this road that is supposed to deliver information. Um, as Robert pointed out, it is not one continuous road. It doesn't just happen, but there are all the, um, there's things that need to happen in order for us to do things like read and spell um, and work with the written word. Um, I often like to say that, you know, dyslexia is a spectrum. And I know that Michael spoke about it um, in terms of autism, but we don't necessarily talk about it, even though that's the case with dyslexia. Meaning um, there are so many different ways that dyslexia can manifest and um, the severity um, may look different based on the individual. For me, I like to say that I am severely dyslexic because at the age of 32, I can identify certain words that a fourth grader can but not enough to get through an entire fourth grade passage, let alone practice law, right? Um, I often hear from people who, who will ask me, well, what is it like having dyslexia? Um, it's, it's a difficult question to answer um, because my brain is my brain. <laughs> and I think for many people with disabilities, we are just living life. But when I sat back and thought about, okay, well, what makes my process in reading look different than my friends and family who, who don't have dyslexia, I will often describe my brain as um, a brain full of filing cabinets, like many of um, other brains, except for when I'm breaking down a word, like the word cat, at, the sounds that go along with the words, the um, the phonemic awareness needed to um, decode, to read, encode, to spell, right? My brain is not putting those word chunks in the right filing cabinet. So when I see the word again, like cat, by the first, second, third, fourth grade, you just see the word and it all comes together because you see it and the sound chunks are pulled from the filing cabinet and there goes cat. For me, I'm sounding out and I'm breaking down that word for the first time every time, right? Um, and, you know, there are supports, right? Multisensory education um, methodologies that are rooted in the science of teaching reading that can help children and adults kind of um, strengthen those roads that I talked about before, um, connect those pathways to begin to, um, to recognize and put together sounds. Um, 
But like many of the disabilities that we talked about tonight, um, dyslexia is not something that will be cured, right? Um, we know that there are methods that can help improve our reading. Um, and then there's the aspect of navigating the written world. As Robert pointed out, um, a lot of times um, the individual, the, the, the experiences that the individual is experiencing um, may not be a disability in another context, right? Like my ability to read is not necessarily an issue um, until I have to read. Unfortunately, our society is a print-based society. And so navigating the world, whether that's taking the subway, driving with instructions, going to the supermarket and buying toothpaste, showing up to school, we can definitely say in a space of academia, you need to know how to read because that is the way our society um, has has um, dictated we would communicate. We um, it is the expectation, um, and so it's really about learning how to navigate this written world that we have. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the next slide shows a picture of um, a typical reader's brain and a brain of someone with dyslexia. Um, again, it's those neural pathways, the parts that are lighting up. Um, again, how each individual experiences this may be very different. Um, but there are basic things that I think um, for so many of us have proven to be tried and true. And so for me, multi-sensory instruction um, or in Gillingham-based instruction was incredibly helpful for me as well as assistive technology. So I like to say that my computer reads to me and I talk to my computer. So text-to-speech, speech-to-text, word prediction, um, software and note-taking software has really helped me, as well as accommodations, whether that was in school, whether that was on standardized tests like the bar exam, or even in my everyday practice, um, as well as real supportive educators and family members. So along my educational journey, there were many points where the educators, my family, myself, we didn't know um, what we know now. Um, but having the support of educators and a family who was dedicated to what the success could look like was crucial, right? Um, I was able to graduate with a New York State Regents diploma despite the ignorant comments um, <laughs> to suggest otherwise. Um, I attended um, an undergraduate university as part of their learning disability program and was forced to choose a, a, a law school that had really strong disability supports. I say that to say that I consider myself and I was a special education student. I'm a special education adult. Um, I'm a practicing attorney with a disability. Um, and as Robert points out, um, it, it was really important for me to be open about my journey and my disability because I found, especially in practice, that so many families didn't even know someone who had a disability, right? Um, whether that was my exact disability or not, right? So I have um, children who are diagnosed with autism or, or ADD or any other disability. And to be able to say either I have a lived experience that mirrors that or I have a dear friend named Michael or Robert or my husband who has ADD and really speak to the fact that we are here, right? Like we're navigating this space, we have navigated it, um, has really informed my, my uh, practice and, and feeling like uh, it is my responsibility to center that child, right? Oftentimes I'm in spaces where the adults are making such um, decisions with the best interests of that young person, but that young person's voice isn't in the space, right? Or their experience isn't in the space, right? Um, so whether that's something um, seemingly small, right? Um, like we're talking about comp services for a student. Um, and I'll have to say, wait, 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 wait. Um, as Robert points out, there are all these things that this student is dealing with, right? Like I like to say, I'm dyslexic 24 hours a day. 
not just when I'm in your English class or your history class or your math class, right? And so acknowledging the student's experience of wake from the time you wake up, you were doing something that naturally your brain was not wired to do, right? Um, from the time you wake up and then when you get to school at like eight in the morning to three, and then you go to tutoring and you have this pull out and this push in it, right? And what does that mean for a child, right? Um, does that mean that we need to stop and think about what their schedule is gonna look like? Does that mean that we need to give them credit or grace, right? So I've had people say, well, you know, by the time they get to me, you know, they can't sit still, they don't wanna do this. I'm thinking, uh, do you know how much work that student puts in to show up, to, to be present, right? Um, so having that perspective, um, wanting to, um, have a have a, a, a person centered approach to how we are going to um, handle their case, um, or even just being able to relate to family. I find that my lived experience as someone with dyslexia and being open about it, I often am speaking with families, maybe even through an intake process, and you could hear the family's desperation. Um, not just to be helped, right? Not just for this like legal representation, but to prove that their child is smart or worthy or capable, right? Like, yeah, yeah, but, but you have to understand, right? And so sometimes in that moment, I find myself just disclosing to say, when you show up in front of me, your child is presumed worthy, presumed competent, right? Like we will start from there right? Oftentimes that alone helps put families at ease because they realize I'm not proving that my child is worthy of something. I can show up in space and we can talk about the facts needed to move forward, right? Um, other times um, it's being able to have real conversation um, with families about the process because I think um, Robert and Michael can agree with me that we meet families at different stages of this special education process, right? Whether that's an IEP meeting, a due process hearing, a school meeting, reentry meeting, IEP meeting, um, uh, or even just diagnosis or proper diagnosis. And to be able to have conversations about, um, well, what is an MPS? What is a private school? What are what, what sets? What does this mean? How does it feel to be pulled out of a classroom? Um, what what was it like to go to these spaces? If my child has this placement or goes to whatever, will they be able to re-enter a less restrictive environment? Real conversations that oftentimes families feel like they cannot have because they don't know anyone to have these conversations. So I think for me. I, you know, I'm very open because I think that that is a real important part of our process, um, not just as individuals, but as families, right, to be able to understand, um, A, that you're not alone. So for so many of my clients and families, there is this feeling of, um, well, on Friday, I had a parent who was in tears and she said, my son asked mommy, am I stupid, right, a ninth grader, mommy, am I stupid? What's going on? Like, I, 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 I need you to help. I need you to do something. And as, as painful as that was to hear, right, um, I was able to say, I know that feeling that your son is feeling because I felt it. And my parents sat in your seat. My mom and dad sat in your seat. We've cried these tears. And unfortunately, um, I'm saddened to, to know that so many years later, I, I'm hearing you guys experience the same scenario, the same uh, um, uh, a feeling. But what I can promise you is that you're not alone. That I, Robert, Michael, we have had lived experiences. So you, your child, your family, they're part of my tribe now, right? <laughs> they are part of a bigger community. And so it informs how I connect with families and my approach to solving problems, right? Or, or looking at the situation. Um, I could probably go on forever. So I'm gonna stop there because I really want to have a, a chance to really do Q&A. I think that is when these conversations become really meaningful. So 
There we go. I took that as my cue. All right. <laughs> um, I think um, we are having someone monitor the chat for questions. So if there are any questions. Um, I just want to there's a couple of questions in the. Sorry, I just wanted to add to one quick thing for Tara said, which is about what's going on inside. This is something that's often an issue in special ed that we look at just the academics and we don't look at the social emotional. And I talk a lot about that because it's such a big issue in the autism world. It's not just academics and too often they look just at the grades in the academic. I just wanted to add that point. Um, there's a question is, um, I think this one came up when, uh, when Robert, you were talking, um, has medication helped you and how? Or, no. Medication's a tough subject because parents have, uh, or people in general <clears throat> have, you know, certain, uh, thoughts one way or another, and I don't promote it, but I have been taking um, ADHD medication now for 22 years, and it has made a huge difference in my life. Uh, the important thing to know, and this is to touch on something Michael said earlier, is that it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't cure my ADHD. It helps me manage it. It's one of many tools uh, that I use along with, you know, um, coping skills that I've developed over 50, almost 58 years, um, a sense of humor, uh, working with coaches, who I can't say enough good things about because I think it really is, if I had to describe ADHD coaching in one word, I would say empowerment. And many of these kids or adults with ADHD feel like they uh, are powerless. Um, working with a therapist, you really have to look at it in a multimodal approach. And also I run, uh, which is as important to me as, um, as my ADHD medication, sometimes if not more so. So um, I've had good experiences. Uh, I think it's a personal choice that you have to make, uh, but I wouldn't make it or not make it based upon what you hear from people around you. I think it's important that you speak to a doctor, a doctor who's qualified, uh, and perhaps ask questions of other people that take medication. Uh, uh, here's another question. Uh, Fatara gave some tips on tools, technologies, which helped her. What are the assistive technology skills which are helpful to students with ADHD or ASD? Well, I'll go first because it'll be quicker. Technology <laughs> in autism is complicated because it really depends again on the individual. Like when I was in college and law school, I used the computer a lot because I have anxiety over handwriting. But that's me. That doesn't mean every autistic will. I have anxiety about handwriting because my handwriting is illegible. But I think it, it depends. I mean, a lot of the nonverbal or limited verbal autistics use iPads. They use uh, text to speech. They talk by writing in the iPad and letting it dictate. So I think it's really, again, so unique to each individual. I, I think that's really important, Michael, because I think that. Um, <clears throat> You know, people will come to me if I'm speaking at an adult uh, seminar or something or at a conference, and they'll say, well, clearly you're an, a, an, an attorney with ADHD, so you've got it all figured out. And I don't. I swear I don't. And if you don't believe me, just take five minutes and speak to my wife, and she <laughs> will tell you how disorganized and what a mess I can be. However, I think the most important thing, and, and I've developed some coping mechanisms that can work really well for me. Um, but they constantly have to be adjusted. And I think more importantly than saying, try this, you know, calendaring system or this software is you really have to take a good, hard, introspective look at yourself. Are you a visual processor? Are you an auditory processor? That's really important. I got this great idea. I was running a, um, support group for adults many years ago and this guy came in this was before cell phones so this shows you how long ago it was and what he did he was a doctor actually a physician <clears throat> an emergency room physician no surprise and he um his thing was when he would think of something before he would forget it with his short-term memory he would find a pay phone and call and leave himself a message on his answering machine. And I heard that and I thought it was such a great idea because I would have these ideas, but like those airplanes in the photo, you lose it. 
And so I went out and bought like a personal tape recorder and I recorded every thought that popped into my head. Great idea. After about two weeks, it was a huge disaster for me because I never listened to the tape. And But mm -hmm. what I did get out of that experience is that I need to see things visually. And so I've developed a number of tools and, you know, highlightings and software and anything that's visual because I learned that about myself. So you really have to keep an open mind about, you know, technology, which can also be a double-edged sword. I mean, computers are wonderful, um, but they can be a, a, a vortex of time suckage. And, you know, with social media now adds to just, you know, regular internet distractions. So you have to temper that, but you really have to think about how you respond. I would also just jump in and like to, to add that I often say when it comes to especially assistive technology, start with the problem you're trying to solve, not the disability. Right. Um, and what does that mean and why is that important? So, for instance, there are so many times when I speak to families and they'll tell me, oh, my child is failing science history and they just they just keep going on and on because, you know, they're dyslexic. And I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. These things are not mutually exclusive. But let's back up what's going on, right? And so when you really break down, okay, let's talk about the scenario here. And you find out, hmm, okay, the reason why they're failing is because they never hand in their homework for someone who has ADD, for example. They did the homework. <laughs> it never made it, you know, back to school. It never made it out of the book, but like whatever, right? Or you know, my child is really struggling with homework and you think, okay, so it must be because they're having trouble focusing or they, they're having trouble with decoding. And it's, uh, the teacher goes so fast, I can't copy the homework on the board, right? And so really starting with, well, what is the problem? When you figure out, okay, this is what I'm trying to address, then you can begin to look at assistive technology that might help with that task. So you might have the same, tool at the end of the day that someone with dyslexia, um, ADD, and um, visual impairment end up all using the same software, right? The same note-taking software, because the issue is maybe copying everything down and do the homework, not, okay, we're going to start with what what devices help people with ADD, right? Um, I know that that's a gross overstatement, but I really find that when you start from that perspective, it's really helpful. Because what we also hear, what Robert is saying is that assistive technology is this new buzzword, but oftentimes we've been doing it for decades, right? So the idea that people give me flack for um, speech to text, for instance, and I'm thinking, uh, people got secretaries for forever, right? Um, you know, um, they gave you flack for spell checking. Again, secretary. So like we have accommodated in other ways and informally forever, what assistive technology really allows for people is, is the independence to do it themselves, right? So as Robert is saying, the computer could be great. I always like to say technology is great until it's not. Um, but sometimes we'll end up needing other technologies for the issue we're trying to solve. So Robert is saying, I, I need to see things, right? And so maybe the computer is great, but now I'm sucked into that black hole. So now I'll use assistive technology that times me out of things, right? Like there's, it's endless as to how we can begin to layer on AT, but if we start with what is the problem I'm trying to solve, we usually get to the right device. And remember that the journey for finding the right AT tool is a windy one that even if I said this is the device I use, it doesn't mean that, you know, Robert or somebody else with dyslexia will find it helpful. And that's OK, because as Michael said, if you meet one person with autism, you met one person with autism. I think that is across the board. And so give whomever it is that is going through this process grace to explore what works for them. And the technology is always advancing and changing. Whatever yep. Katara used in, when she graduated high school 14 years ago is probably obsolete by now. So, <clears throat> so do each of you think you were helped or hindered by a pull out or a placement in a special placement? I'm 
assuming that might be a special school. I think Patara's got to answer that question because she's had the experience. <laughs> yeah, I can answer a little, but I'm going to let Patara take the first lead. So this is always a really tough one for me. I think that people have varying experiences. Um, for me personally, um, I think it really depended on where I was in my life, right? Um, I've had really good ICT experiences, right? Um, in an ICT class when I was younger. Um, but I really found benefit in attending a school just for children with language-based learning disabilities, right? Um, as I progressed throughout my educational journey, my needs changed um, and not just academically. I know that this is a very touchy subject for a lot of people, um, but you know, I acknowledge that there are reasons why um, it may be more comfortable for a student to um, be in a, in a, um, a self-contained setting. So um, the benefit for me um, in that type of environment was I got to just be a kid, right? And what I mean by that is when I was not in that placement, even in let's say law school, I said, you know, I hate this mainstream thing because I'm running to catch up with you guys, right? The teacher gives a certain amount of assignments. You have to read seven books. It's gonna take four hours, like whatever it is, right? And it's gonna take me twice as long. So I am on this hamster wheel to keep up versus a program that was tailored to me and people like me where we got the point three books in. I didn't need seven books. <laughs> when it was expected that, you know, people often say, well, what did my MPS uh, give me that the DOE couldn't provide? And I often say it didn't do anything the DOE couldn't do. It just did what the DOE wasn't doing. And what I mean by that was I got to go to school I could do my homework in a reasonable time. I got to hang out with friends. I got to, you know, uh, date. I got to do the things that oftentimes I saw my peers who were mainstreamed um, in a different way, who were always fighting to keep up with these um, uh, after school tutoring and interventions and all of this other stuff. And that I experienced when I was in other settings. Um, I also think, you know, there's a double edged sword to, to pull out services, right? Um, it was often frustrating that I was leaving the classroom or that I didn't get the same amount of electives that everybody else got. Um, but then there was something, um, really comforting in the idea that I was in a safe space. Um, where I was working on what I needed to work on. Um, I think the downside was that other students without disabilities didn't exactly know what was going on in that room. <laughs> and so stigma began to happen that way. Um, but because I personally was open about what was going on, I think um, I think there were other students who were like, wait, why can't I go with Miss So-and-so? Um, and so I say that to say that this is not a black or white answer. I found real value um, in pull out and in self-contained environments or specialized schools, but I also really see the benefit for students um, and have experienced the benefit in a more integrated uh, setting. So I, I really, I think it depends. Um, that is a very short, long-winded <laughs> answer, so. <laughs> Um, so here's another question. Oh, it's, let me just add, I was oh. in my private schools, not similar to Patara. They just put me in what they would call throwaway schools. And so that was obviously not a good, a good place. I mean, I'm a little older than Patara, but they put me in schools where basically it was to get rid of kids hmm. that were not the safest places. So here's a sort of a general question, but why did district make it so hard for <clears throat> parents of kids with disabilities? If the district doesn't have the right supports, why does it take, take years before real changes are made? Oh, well, there's a simple answer, money. Yeah. They don't want to spend the money to send kids to private school. School districts fight and fight and fight to not send kids to private <laughs> schools or to out of district placements. And that's why attorneys like us are in business and then what happens is it costs the district more in the long run fighting it out when they could have saved everyone money just by doing it in the, 
by get, doing the right placement in the beginning. That's an important uh, thing that you touched on there, Michael, because I think that, you know, if you understand that as a parent going into this minefield of special education and you understand that, and in all honesty, in all fairness to the school district, they have a finite budget and they have to throw the blanket of education over thousands of children. Um, I don't excuse uh, their uh, withholding things, but if you understand that mindset, for instance, I did a seminar one night, I was speaking at a, a group, a parenting group, and what I was trying to do was get parents to think in terms of how many things can you think of that might accommodate your child's disability that costs the school nothing or next to nothing. OK, and it did accomplish two things, putting parents in that frame of mind, got them to kind of understand where the other side was coming from, which I think is always very important. But also it got parents to think about the impact their decisions would have on their child. OK, and, and there was one woman who raised her hand and she said, actually, I have a story. She said, my son was on the hockey team in school and he had ADHD. And every year I would get all of these behavioral reports and he never did his homework. And there were all these issues. But during hockey season, things somehow kind of clicked and he I would get much less behavioral reports from him. He had less idle time because he was practicing the exercise was doing him good. He was just, he was a totally different person. And so I was at a 504 meeting and I was kind of scratching my head. And I said to everybody, look, you give him gym twice a week. Could you give him gym four times a week? And they all kind of looked at each other and said, yeah, we could do that. And she said, it made a world of difference for my son. And, and, and I like that story because it was kind of understanding the kind of the, 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 the battlefield, so to speak, but also this mom really knew her kid. And, and to kind of touch on what Pataro was saying earlier about the assistive technology and, and focusing on the problem. I hope people take away a lot of little nuggets from, you know, the three of our perspectives, but the one thing that I can't stress enough to parents out there listening to me, I'm on my soapbox now, talk to your kids, okay? Don't just go research ADHD and the teacher said the kids with ADHD do this or that's the, the assistive technology that you use. Talk to your kids, what's frustrating them? What makes them angry about school? What makes them feel powerless at school? And work the problem from the inside out. And you know, when you sit with your child, and engage them in that conversation. It's not just about mom or dad going to the school to talk about them. They're involved and they're driving the process and they should be. And so just keep that in mind. Uh, uh, there's another there's a question for you, Robert. Uh, Mr. Tedesco, please describe what is a good coach and if you had one in school. Well, I think there's a coach out there right now listening to us a, a close friend of mine but a coach essentially is and, and if you think about it think about it like a uh, tennis coach or a um, uh, basketball coach or something a coach can't manufacture talent in their athlete but they a good coach can help their athlete recognize I'm stronger on my right side or on my left side and have them kind of tailor their game to their strengths. And, and this is really about gravitating towards your strengths and understanding and respecting your weaknesses to learn how to dance around them. And coaches, I mean, it, it's kind of an unfortunate name because everybody thinks, well, I'll just give him positive support and I'm coaching him. It's, it's a very, very specialized skill. And I apologize to the coach that's watching me tonight if I'm misrepresenting this or oversimplifying it, but essentially coaches work in a non-directive questioning approach. And what they do is they don't, the difference between a coach and a tutor is they don't teach them uh, what to do. They don't tell them what to do. They're not a mentor in the sense that they don't try to get them to emulate their own behavior, the coach's behavior. What the coach does is ask questions and pulls information to help these, the coachee recognize 
you know, issues and how they approach things and they kind of work the problem together. And they make a, a an agreement of sorts, a partnership, and they develop goals that are the goals of the person being coached, not the teacher's goals, not the parent's goals, not the coach's goals. It's the person who's being coached, the student's goals, and the two of them develop a path to achieve those goals. And along that process, the student and the coach kind of work out a system so that the person can hold themselves accountable to things they commit to doing. And it really is a wonderful process. The only drawback to it is that kids have to step up and agree to work with a coach and buy into the process. And a lot of times when I speak, it's especially important with kids making the transition from high school to college uh, or post-secondary. But what happens is I'll do a presentation and, and talk about the value of coaching, but the, the issue is parents will raise their hand and say, well, we try, we told our son when he went off to college that we'd let him try it for the first semester, but if he didn't do well, he has to get a coach. So now the coach becomes the punishment. So you got to be careful. You have to encourage, but don't push because they have to be ready to accept this themselves. There are a number of coaches that are out there that are excellent. Um, it's, uh, there are things that you can look to. There are coaches organizations that talk about criteria and different things. I used to be the executive director of an organization that provides coaches for students with uh, executive functioning and ADHD. But there's a lot of information out there. You could certainly contact me. Um, I can put you in touch with coaches or coaches organizations so you can find somebody that will work with you or that you feel comfortable with. Uh, what advice would you have with respect to resisting a school's effort to focus on a student's behavior instead of the school environment and the child's neurology that may be causing the behavior? Um, in terms of behavior, I'll, I do a lot of behavioral stuff, so I'll, I'll just touch on that. What Michael said earlier is really important to know, that there's a lot more that goes into a, being a student at a school than their, grades, their, their letter grades on their report card. And it's important to think of it that way because think of it for a second. If a straight-A student did something terrible at school, they were caught vaping, they threatened somebody, and that straight A student's parents went to a disciplinary meeting and said, but my son is a straight A student. That, those parents, I am 100% sure, the school would say there's a lot more go, that goes into being a student at this school than, than the grades they get on their report cards, their academic standing. And if you look at the code of conduct, there is a litany of things that are expected of your child and that they're evaluated against that have nothing to do with academics. They have to be prompt and courteous and respect other people's property and other people's space. And there are a whole bunch of rules. And if you ever read these things, and unfortunately parents don't read the code of conduct until somebody gets suspended, the phrasing is open-ended enough that it can really ensnare kids with disabilities who don't kind of that that play to the beat of a different drummer so to speak and so you know it's really important for parents to do things like understand the code of conduct and also Every report card has a separate column. One is for the, the academic grade and the other one is the teacher's comments. And basically you'll see things like, well, Johnny is smart, but we can't get him to shut his mouth during class or he's never prepared or he's disruptive or any of those things. Those are actually on the report card that are evaluating his performance as a student. It is perfectly fair for a teacher, for a parent to say, I don't care if he's getting a B on his report card. All of these comments are horribly negative. What can we do to address these behaviors? It's, it's integral to his experience as a student, just as it is, um, you know, the discipline that you provide in your household. So just kind of keep that in mind throughout that process. Well, and let me add that, you know, what Robert's saying is true. I see a lot of cases where the school will say, 
look, it's it's not our school. The kid's just a bad kid. He's just a bad kid. And they blame it on the kid. And they're, you're right, the environment is a big factor. I have clients where they say this is just not the right environment because this environment is not helping them and the environment is affecting them emotionally. Uh, <clears throat> have you had success during school disciplinary proceedings tying the alleged wrongdoing to a disability to persuade a school, a school sorry, or a third party that punishment is not a logical consequence or a helpful deterrent as it may be for a neurotypical student? It sounds like they're asking about a manifestation determination. Yeah. And as I always say, generally those go against the, the parent. I've won a few of them, but I find more often than not the decision in my mind is predetermined. Well, again, what you have to do here is you really have to think about it from the other side's perspective and understand the psychology of what's going on here, okay? A middle school, a high school is probably the closest thing you will find outside of law enforcement to a prison, okay? The kids are regimented. They're kind of constantly counting heads. Uh, the bell goes off. You have to be here. You have to be there. It's very highly structured. They get their time in the yard every day, just like prisoners do, okay? And so school administrators, and I I'm sorry if I'm being unfair here, are, are often in the role of wardens. And they don't necessarily look to understanding disabilities. Um, and the word manifestation, and, and it's a, a legal term uh, under the law, which is a subject for another uh, uh, seminar, but essentially is the law requires that if a student has a disability, that the school has to make a determination about what they did, but also whether or not what they did um, is a manifestation of their disability. And if that is the case, then they are treated differently. And there's a, a bunch of separate protections for them because of their disability. Oh. But my experience is that the word manifestation like sticks in the throat of the, the, the superintendent or the principal in this of the school. They hate the word manifestation. It makes them feel as if kids are getting a free pass because they have a disability. And what you have to understand is that, again, as Michael and I were saying earlier, you have to separate the conduct from the disability. And what we're saying is whatever they did was wrong. But we need to understand why this behavior occurred so we can prevent we can prevent it from happening tomorrow. And so the school will be safer and you can maintain your order and your discipline. And that's really what manifestation is supposed to do. And so if you approach it that way, as opposed to, well, you can't punish him, he's got ADHD, that really doesn't cut it and, it, and it's going to be problematic understand where the behaviors come from because if there is a manifestation the school is required to do a functional behavioral assessment and to put into place a behavioral intervention plan to head off those behaviors so um but in order to do that you really have to understand where the behaviors are coming from. It's crucial that you have evaluations. It's crucial that you understand your child's disability, that you work with an attorney or an advocate that, you know, understands this. Um, and, uh, you know, and also there's a difference between punishment and consequences, okay? And I will give you an example. Uh, a typical punishment or consequence to a student who's acting up in class is a teacher will say, well, you can't go outside for recess, okay? And that's logical and it's a traditional form of consequence. However, if that kid is hyperactive or has ADHD, that is going to make the situation worse. And that's what you don't want. And I've actually sat in these meetings and said to the teacher, you know this kid. If he doesn't get a chance to run around outside and burn off some of that energy, do you want him in your classroom in the afternoon? There's got to be another way, another type of consequence system that's not going to make the situation worse. And that's really have to, sometimes you need to be creative and they don't always work, but um, there's a lot that can be done. Um, what is uh, helpful for time management and figure out priorities? 
That's a Robert question. If I had the answer to that, I would be a very, very rich man. I was almost late this evening because I was telling Michael last night, I was working on a brief that had to be submitted at the close of business today. And just like those fires and those airplanes, I needed to wait till the last minute. It is a tough struggle every single day. However, people procrastinate for very different reasons, depending on what that task is. And getting to the reason why they're procrastinating can often be very helpful. This is where a coach, for instance, can come in very, very helpful. Because if someone is, if you can get someone to verbalize that, for instance, they're afraid to do the task because they've never done it before and they're not sure what to do, that might prompt them to ask somebody or get an example from somebody. If it's because they're afraid of feedback, there are ways to do that. Uh, the probably, I think, my experience is the hardest is people that just feel like they can't get started Fear and anger can be great motivators. And unfortunately, many people with ADHD don't move forward unless they're forced to. So, you know, that is a plague and it literally drives my wife crazy. I, I can tell you when I speak about, you know, adults with ADHD and couples issues with ADHD, my wife and I were actually on uh, the Today Show uh, when a book came out about couples and ADHD uh, a few years back. But it, it can be maddening. I say to people, I, I don't suffer from ADHD. And people might think, you know, you suffer from this condition. I have ADHD. My wife suffers from ADHD because she's married to me and she's stuck with it. She's, she's along for the ride, whether she likes it or not. And you really have to be mindful of that. <laughs> I want to um, interject just for a second because yeah. I could literally sit here and listen to you guys all night. I want to make sure you guys are okay with that. We, we have, have a couple more questions, questions, but yeah, looks like we have six questions. Questions are always good. Okay. Are you guys good with time? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, how accepting have you all found the legal community of lawyers with learning disabilities? And why did you all choose the legal profession as your specific career path? Well, I think Patara and I both said both of us did it for the same reason of we grew up and we wanted to help other children avoid the problems we went through growing up. I, I don't want to speak for Patara, but we've both done this many times and have had that same answer. I think Robert's answer is a little different because he was diagnosed older. Yeah, um, uh, there really are two reasons. Number one it was... Uh, the only book I was able to get myself to read as a kid was To Kill a Mockingbird. And all I ever wanted to be was Atticus Finch. But the other side of it is that as a child, I, I wouldn't say I was necessarily bad. I was certainly mischievous, but I was as spectacularly obnoxious, I would say. It was probably the best way to describe myself. And I heard once that a nickname or a slang expression for a lawyer was a mouthpiece. And I instantly decided that's the career for me. I can make a living out of talking, uh, you know, and then in terms of the type of law that we practice, I think we all have a common, you know, feeling that, you know, we, we provide a voice for people with a unique perspective. And, you know, I certainly wouldn't want children to go, for me, it's like I get an opportunity to do it over again. All of the things I struggled with, you know, when I was young, I'm a lot older than Michael and Patara. When I was young, they didn't call Not it ADD. Lot. They called it BAD, you know, you were just the bad kid. And so, you know, we do a lot more to shine a light on that. Um, and I think the only way to tackle stigma is to bring it out in the open. And I, I am sure Michael and, and Patara feel the same way. Patara, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I echo why, um, why special education law in particular, right? Like I really... Um, from a very young age, I remember being in third grade and I've shared this with Michael and advocating for, you know, my classmates and friends, right? <laughs> I remember going to IEP meetings of uh, friends who were in public school, um, not in self-contained classes, who didn't know they had disabilities and going to their 
parent teacher conference and saying, look, I know so and so must have a learning challenge because, you know, you pull her out for testing. But she told me the reason why she's pulled out is because she's stupid and you guys feel bad for her. What are we going to do? Right. And so I <laughs> having that kind of um that kind of energy or, or um, drive to want to help other people made me want to practice special education law. Um, I will say that I haven't found the legal community um, generally to be um, particularly accepting of people with disabilities. I find that most people are very ignorant. Um, I find that um, oftentimes, uh, especially in, in, in law school, there's this idea that uh, people are the gatekeepers of the legal profession. And so I was surprised to find that people who know the law should know how to look up the law are very ignorant to the law. Um, and so it was quite a difficult um, journey for me um, becoming an attorney um, and, and having the right to um, all the things that I spoke about, accommodations, et cetera. Um, and I often found it really lonely um, because even, even though I didn't know many attorneys with disabilities, I was really active in the disability um, uh, legal space. And so I got to meet different types of um, dis people with disabilities and, and, and learn their journeys um, and, and really begin to ask them um, rather than my school community or even at work, um, what worked for them. Um, but what I haven't really come across, and I, I can't wait to meet this person one day, is someone who's as severely dyslexic as I am and an attorney, right? I often heard stories of um, current practicing attorneys when I was in law school who said, oh, I found out I was dyslexic when my kid got diagnosed, right? Um, and, and even though, you know, I think there's a connection there for sure, because I know if, if they're doing it, I could do it too. But there is this sense of, yeah, but you're not as dyslexic as I am. And so you can answer questions as to how you ask for accommodations at work or um, in, in court you know, and, and the process being different in federal court than when I practiced, you know, in state court or due process hearing, um, and really feeling like I was navigating the space um, for the first time, knowing that I'm not, I, I can't possibly be, we know the statistics, um, but that feeling is a feeling that I, I felt throughout uh, my educational career um, and professionally time and time again. And so again, as Robert points out, it's one of the reasons I am so, so open and I'm so, so vocal because it doesn't mean that my personal experience is going to be your personal experience, but at least it gives people a place to start, whether that's an open conversation or to try the things that I've tried or to not try the things that were an utter disaster. Um, and uh, yeah, I haven't found um, in some ways the legal community to be totally embracing of disability. I think um, advocates and activists in this space are forcing that. And so I, I acknowledge that there's so much that has changed. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to be here today. And I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that, you know, even a decade ago, um, I wouldn't have been able to, to practice the way that, that I practice now. Um, and we have come a long way. So um, I know this is similar to my other answer in that <laughs> it's not black and white. Um, but that's my journey to, to, to why I want to practice and why I practice this field. And I've done a lot with the attorneys with disability stuff. And there are, if, I think it runs the gamut. I think there are people who are welcoming and people who are not, people who are, you know, full of themselves and people who are understanding. I think it's no universal, but I will also say, I think we do need more lawyers with disabilities. And what I've learned is we have lawyers with almost every disability. The only thing I've ever, I've never found is a lawyer with an intellectual disability, because you still have to do the capable level of work to be a lawyer. So that's a little different. But I've, I mean, there are two, blind lawyers are a dime a dozen. I always say there's so many of them. Deaf lawyers, physical impairments, autism, ADHD, dyslexia. They're out there. There's, there's a lot out there. Uh, could the panelists share their post-secondary education? Uh, curious as to what colleges, law schools were supportive to their unique educational needs. I think Patara should start this one because she's got the most interesting story on this. 
I'll try to be brief. Um, I attended Adelphi University for undergrad um, because they had a really, um, uh, I don't want to say well-known, um, but a uh, learning disability program that had been in existence for a, a really long time and, and was incredibly um, supportive. Um, I had a real journey to finding a law school. I attended Syracuse University College of Law where I got a joint degree. Um, so I also attended Syracuse School of Education. Um, I found that because Syracuse was attached to a larger university, I got more supports than other law schools that I had looked into. Um, some law schools without being named um, said things like, oh, I thought you would have a seeing eye dog or and we're so excited to have you, but how do you plan on doing this, right? Um, and I knew right away that those would not be the law schools for me. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I think in a lot of ways, Syracuse um, was better than the rest, even though I had real, real challenges there as well and really had to advocate for myself. Um, there is a huge list of schools that have some level of disability support. I would caution families to really learn the difference between um, uh, whether it's special education colleges versus mainstream colleges, colleges that have programs within mainstream um, colleges, the difference between learning dis disability programs and um, offices of dis disability studies. Obviously, we know legally um, there has to be some level of so of um, accommodation given to, to um, adults with disabilities under the ADA that really looks so different depending on the school and also depending on the person's needs. So even though I graduated Syracuse University College of Law, I don't think, I strongly believe that I would not have succeeded there in undergrad. I needed a lot more support than that school offered. And because I went there as a law student, student and not an undergrad student, I knew my rights and I was able to navigate the space in a way that others were not. Um, and so I don't think there's a one size fits all. And I think the schools that, you know, may accommodate certain disabilities over the other um, is also something to think about just because they were really great for students with ADD doesn't necessarily mean they'll be great for students with dyslexia. Um, I think there's a difference because all the disabilities we talked about today, as we mentioned, are um, spectrums. And so, you know, it depends on your level, depends on the, the need of support. And so I caution you, um, knowing the schools that we went to is a good starting point, um, but it's probably a whole other webinar to really dig, dig deep into um, kind of navigating uh, the college and um, post-secondary uh, worlds for individuals with disabilities. Uh, here's, uh, I'm a special ed teacher and a special ed parent. Can you discuss the legal aspect of lack of staff? The school's in survival mode every day due to lack of teachers and paraprofessionals. I don't, well, I, I don't think, know if that's something you want to touch on. Well, I think the issue is we obviously can't control staffing at schools. That's beyond our right. control. But regardless of whether the school has the staff, they have to find an appropriate program. It doesn't take away their legal obligation. I mean, if they don't have enough staff, they must not, maybe they're not paying enough, but they still have a legal obligation to provide a free and appropriate public education for that child's individual needs. And if they don't have the staff, find a school that does and pay for it meaning the district pay for it. Uh, uh, we have another, this, uh, this I, I thought schools were not allowed to take recess. So this was a conversation a little while ago. Uh, they probably, I don't know if you need to go into that, but there's another question. Uh, it's been very helpful from a parental understanding perspective. Is there a teacher administration training that any of you provide to help with understanding of how to meet children where they are at executive functioning wise? At this point, my son is just being labeled as a behavioral problem for not completing work. Even though he's diagnosed with ADHD, they see it as purposeful. They don't seem to understand that you can't punish the ADHD out of the kid. That sounds like a situation where you need a lawyer. Right, let me cut you off, Robert. No, that's okay. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so 
uh, I just I lost my train of thought for a second there. Um, with respect to um, education uh, for schools, I have done some in-service trainings for schools about uh, positive behavioral supports and to educate uh, teachers about ADHD and other disabilities. And I really have to say that the teachers that I've run into genuinely get into that profession because they want to help kids and they want to educate kids. Um, and I think that what I've gotten from teachers is that they don't get enough training and uh, information about how to address um, various disabilities because they're really on the front lines. And when you think about those battle lines, typically it's between parent and administration. The teachers, and, and you know, there are exceptions, you know, a teacher has an antiquated view of ADHD, the kid's just lazy or something. But I think as a general proposition, my stereotype would be a teacher really wants to help kids. And I, I think that they are craving information because not only do they want to help kids, but they also want to have a productive classroom. And I don't think they get enough tools and information from the administration or the city or you know whoever it is. So I think that's unfortunate. And I, I applaud you know educators that come out to these types of things or to to tune into them because they they want to know and they want to help. So we have one more question and then I think we're gonna call it a, a night. Uh, what is a good test for dyslexia for a district to use? That's all you, Patara. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna step too much into this one. Um, I'm from New York City. And um, if, if you guys are aware, our mayor is tackling this very issue. Um, I think, um, there is a difference between a screener for students who are struggling with reading um, and what we would call like an assessment for a district to use, right? Um, I also wanna uh, kind of point out that dyslexia is our colloquial term for specific learning disability in the DSM-5, right? Um, whether that's specific learning disability with impairment in reading, impairment of spelling, impairment of mathematics, et cetera, impairment of uh, written expression. Um, and so, um, you know, I think uh, uh, psychoeducational or neuropsychological evaluation is really um, what's needed to get a good understanding of how that kiddo learns um, and where their real weaknesses are. I think it's difficult for districts because I think um, not all evaluations and not all evaluators are created equal. Let's just put it like that. Um, and I really think, you know, when you look at a really comprehensive uh, neuropsych, for instance, um, it not only talks about where the weaknesses are, it makes um, really robust com um, recommendations in terms of um, methodologies that maybe should be used. Um, accommodations in in the classroom placement etc um and so it's a tough question to answer because i think there are screenings that i could definitely rattle off that that may um, give us indication that the student is struggling and that they may even need rti or they may even need sets um but what does that mean is it quote unquote dyslexia right so we you know is it a specific learning disability as we commonly know to be dyslexia do they need um a certain methodology like multi-sensory education, I think really comes from a, a robust evaluation. So that is my, my short but long response. All right. And I will just add to the evaluation piece, always yeah. get independent evaluations. It's important to have that outside perspective, but as Patara said, not all evaluations are created equally. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. You three are truly inspiring, not only in how you've overcome challenges and developed these amazing careers, but also in the very special way that you develop relationships with your, with your clients. Um, so thank you for sharing your, your journeys and also for tips on, you know, things that parents should look for in an attorney, frankly. You know, it's, it's very valuable to have one that has, that has actually lived what their child is living. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for thank having you. us. Yeah, and giving us the opportunity to reach out to parents. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. 
we always appreciate doing this. And if you want to see this again, come to San Francisco in March for COPA. <laughs> oh, all right. I'll be on that plane. Yes. <laughs> Bye, guys. guys. Have, Have a good evening. Day. Have a good evening. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.